So thanks everyone for coming out today to our ACOM seminar. I am happy to introduce Rebecca Schwantes today. Uh, Becky, you, most of you already know her, but I will give a short introduction. So Becky got her PhD from Caltech in 2017. Uh, during her PhD, she did work with chamber experiments to understand gas phase uh, chemical mechanisms. Her primary advisor was John Seinfeld, and her secondary advisor was Paul Wember. Uh, she received a couple of years ago the NCAR ASP postdoctoral fellowship, and is currently a postdoc still in ACOM, uh, working on improving chemistry in CSM CAMCHEM. Uh, with that, thanks Becky for coming out today. All right, thanks for everyone for coming. Can you hear me okay? Okay, good. Um, so I'm Becky Schwantes. Uh, I've been updating isoprene and terpene chemistry over the last several years now, a couple of years. Um, and it's, the project's actually coming to a completion, so this is like the perfect time to give you guys a seminar on it, so it's great. And mostly I've been focusing on trying to improve simulated surface ozone in CSM CAMCAM. And first I'd like to thank my co-authors for all their help with the chemical mechanism development and also the modeling um, help. And also the Seeker Science team, because I'm going to be comparing against the Seeker's field campaign results, and it was really useful to have these observations for comparing to the model. So the problem I'm trying to address is that ozone is consistently overpredicted in the southeast US in the summer in CAMCAM. And this happens in many models. It's not just CAMCAM. And this happened in older versions of CAMCAM. On the left is Tomes et al. 2015 paper showing that the PDFs of surface ozone are um, overpredicting in the models. And then this is also the same results are showing in the newest release of CSM 2.10, which is the release I'm using for this work. Um, and we also see an over um, predict oh, that the ozone is uh, higher in the model than in the observation. And so what I'm plotting here is the daily max eight hour average ozone. Uh, if you're not really familiar with this, it's kind of the, um, it's typically the average daily uh, concentration of ozone. Uh, that's where ozone is typically the highest. Um, and it's going to be abbreviated as DMA8 um, throughout the talk. And I've averaged this over all of August 2013. And then uh, the contours are the model uh, results. And then the uh, markers are the US EPA CASNET monitoring, monitoring data. And you can see specifically in the eastern US, we're over predicting by quite a bit in the model. So this is what we're trying to fix. Um, and ozone is a complicated pollutant to simulate, though. It's not directly emitted, and its production and loss pathways are extremely nonlinear. So this makes it really hard to get right within models. You have to get a lot of things right. I'm going to be talking a lot about the oxidation chemistry. And by this, I mean the actual chemistry, and also wet and dry deposition and aerosol uptake of the gas phase compounds. But you also have to get dynamics, emissions, clouds, and deposition correct um, in order to capture ozone correctly for the right reasons, which is the objective of models. So I'm going to be talking today a lot about isoprene and terpenes. They're biogenic VOCs, volatile organic compounds. And uh, this is most important in the Southeast US. If you guys have visited Southeast US, there's lots of trees there. So the biogenic VOCs are most likely to be the largest contributor. And if we update their chemistry, we'll have the largest impact um, for the results. And then uh, there's also VOCs from fires and anthropogenic VOCs as well. Um, and then. Also, you have um, anthropogenic emissions of NOx, also biogenic emissions of NOx from uh, soil and lightning. And these interact in the atmosphere to form ozone along with sunlight. So basically, VOCs will react with OH um, to form a proxy radical. The proxy radical will react with NO to form an organic nitrate or NO2. NO2 will photolyze to form ozone. The organic nitrate, we really have to capture the fate of the organic nitrate properly in order to capture ozone correct. So if the fate of the nitrate is just to photolyze or react with OH quickly and then re-release NO2, then not much has changed in this overall cycle. But if the organic nitrate um, is lost through deposition or aerosol uptake, for example, then you end up removing NOx formation potential and you don't end up forming as much ozone. So the purpose of this work and updating the chemistry is to get the formation and specifically also the fate of the organic nitrates correct within the model. And so the bias um, in the southeast US is not unique to CAMCAM. This is an older paper by Fiore, 2009. Um, and the models, there's many models plotted here, are in gray, and observations are in black. And you can see in the ones in the eastern US, which I've highlighted in red, there's always a bias in the summer for ozone. Um, compared to the models. 
And so there's been many recent improvements to try to understand why this bias occurs and what we can do with models to reduce this bias. So I just kind of wanted to summarize some of the different possibilities. So the Squire et al. 2015 paper um, used the UK Met Office Unified Model and looked at reduced isoprene chemical mechanisms and found that they had some, some um, impact on ozone. Bell Martin et al. 2014 looked at dry deposition of ozone and found this was particularly important for the eastern US for ozone. And then Ruud et al. 2018 used Wharf Chem to show that cloud biases were also impacting surface ozone. So you have a lot of things that could play a role. And then there's some recent work on the emissions as well. We have the Travis et al. 2016 paper, which showed that in order to get ozone correct within their model, so right here basically, um, they had to reduce their non-power plant anthropogenic NEI NOx emissions by 60%, which is a rather large amount. Um, McDonald et al. 2018 paper recently has come out using um, and work chem, and they um, suggested using a fuel-based approach, so like a bottom-up approach, that the NEI and NOx emissions should be reduced by 22%. Um, so more modest changes in the emissions. Um, so this means that potentially there's still kind of room for improvement on what is the remaining biases. So for this talk, I wanted to look at chemistry. And specifically, there's been some evidence to suggest, suggest that the monoterpenes are more important than people have really been previously considering. So a lot of people have, there's been a large focus on isoprene oxidation and improving the isoprene oxidation in chemical mechanisms. But the terpenes have been left out a little bit. And then there's this recent paper in the Seekers, um, for the Seekers campaign that's demonstrated the importance of monoterpenes specifically for SOA formation in the southeast US. And some of these SOA precursors are going to be organic nitrates. And we know from the Fisher et al. 2016 paper that the overall, um, the majority of these organic nitrates get lost by um, uptake to aerosols and then hydrolysis. So we could predict that probably um, updating this terpene chemistry will have an impact on ozone as well. So this study will bring ChemChem up to and beyond other models for description of isoprene and the terpene chemistry um, specifically. So isoprene chemistry is more catching up to what has already been done. But for the terpenes, I'm kind of creating a reduced chemical mechanism that is beyond other models currently. So it's a lot more complicated than the other models are currently using. So then the objective of the study is to update isoprene and terpene chemistry in CSM CamCam. I'm using CSM 2.10 as the released version currently. So I'll update the isoprene and terpene chemistry, evaluate the mechanisms, compare the CamCam results um, to field observations and then test the remaining uncertainties. And I just want to note that the purpose of this result isn't necessarily to get ozone perfect within the model. Um, the purpose of this work is actually to add further constraint to the model so that we reduce the flexibility and tunability. And by further constraint, I mean all the chemical mechanism updates that we have from laboratory studies are external constraints that we can add into the model um, to confirm that, um, that we're kind of getting ozone right for the right reasons in the model. So the current chemical mechanism in CSM CamCam is a TS1 Mozart mechanism. It's an updated version of the Mozart IV chemical mechanism. Uh, it has full tropospheric and stratospheric chemistry. It has all the anthropogenic and bi um, biogenic VOCs oxidation pathways. So it's already fairly complete. What we're doing is using this version and then updating just the isoprene and terpene chemistry. So it still has all of the um, other chemistry within it as well. Um, and then we're going to call the updated isoprene and terpene chemical mechanism the TS2 chemical mechanism throughout the talk, just so you understand. So for isoprene chemistry, there's been many recent updates, um, mostly over the last five years or so. Um, and they're summarized in this chemical review paper, um, of which I helped with, that came out of Caltech. And so largely, I use this review paper amongst um, other studies for developing the reduced isoprene chemical mechanism. Um, some key updates are updates to the proxy radical distribution, um, updates to the methacrylin oxidation through the disomerization pathways. And then um, I was also excited to add in my PhD work. So uh, Schwantes et al. 2015 paper updating isoprene NO3 chemistry. It was kind of exciting because I kind of figured out this chemistry in grad school, and then I got to put it in the model. So that's always a fun thing to do. <laughs> um, so I've added that in as well. So I'm going to try to kind of stay a little bit big picture on explaining the chemistry, but I do want to go into the chemistry because I want to show you the importance of adding in more complexity into these reduced chemical mechanisms, hopefully not overwhelming, but still show the importance. Um, for all of these chemical mechanisms, I tried really hard to not add too many transported species. This increases the computational cost by a lot. 
Uh, fortunately, we can select certain species not to be transported in CSM CAMCAM, and that reduces our computational cost. So I've added in a, a lot of proxy radicals that don't need to be transported to kind of increase the complexity of the chemistry, but try not to increase the cost by too much. Uh, so an example of this is isoprene re react with OH um, to form these alkyl radicals, and then with O2 to form the proxy radicals. And this proxy radical distribution will depend on the RO2 lifetime. Um, basically, you can think of this as like the NO level um, in the atmosphere. And so I've added in this explicitly, kind of, uh, there are some simplifications that are kind of being presented, but some of these rates are not quite uncertain, so this also makes it easy to update this mechanism, and it doesn't add that much computational cost because we're not transporting the proxy radicals. Uh, then I've updated the RO2HO2 chemistry um, to a certain degree, too. Overall, for the isoprene chemistry, the, the general structure was already there. I've just updated um, some of the more minor channels and some of the rates and, the, and branching ratios that needed to be updated. And in gray are kind of like the updates, if you think of it that way. Um, the RO2NO chemistry, originally we just had two uh, hydroxy nitrates forming. I now have four hydroxy nitrate isomers. They all have different fates in the atmosphere, and particularly this aerosol uptake. Um, some of this hasn't been super constrained yet, but later on it'll make it easier for to update the model to be more accurate as well, to have them all separate. And these react with OH to form proxy radicals that then can react with NO, HO2, or to isomerize. Um, in the TS1 Mozart mechanism, this is assumed to react with OH to just then continue the reaction with NO. But I think this is important as we go to lower NOx regimes and NOx emissions get uh, reduced in the future, you're going to have more of these mixed regimes, and it's important to have these um, later generation chemistry. And this compound here, which forms from RO2NO in the first generation and RO2HO2 in the second generation, it was actually detected in the SOAS um, field campaign. So we know that this chemistry happens in the atmosphere, so it should be something that we're including within mechanisms as well. And then I updated the isomerization channels as well. Um, and then I just wanted to highlight the first generation chemistry of above is fairly well understood. There are some still and some uncertainties, though, specifically in the isomerization channels. This has not been as well studied, but it's also really hard to measure in the laboratory, which is probably why it hasn't been as well studied. And also the nitrate yields um, and the hydroproxy yields from the later generation products have not been as well studied. Um, so then we move on to the terpenes. So the terpenes are much more complicated to create a chemical mechanism because there's so many of them. So these are all the structures of the terpenes in our current um, TS1 uh, default, TS1 mechanism, and the, or sorry, not really in the mechanism, but it's in the default TSM 2.10. We're lumping these all into mTERP and beta carry. So even if you're not a chemist per se, you can probably see that the structures look very different between all of these compounds. So to lump them all into one may not be sufficient. Um, some of them, many of them have more than one double bond. Some of them are linear. Some of them have two rings versus one ring. So you have a lot of differences there. Um, and then this is just a quick summary of the TS1 mechanism's um, terpene chemistry right now. So the mTERP and beta carry will react with OH, ozone, and NO3. Um, with different rates, but then the chemistry is all the same, and the chemistry acts mostly like alpha pinene. Um, and then there's other reduced chemical mechanisms. So this is what GeosChem uses. So it was actually created by Brown et al. 2014 for WarfChem, and then Fisher et al. 2016 added it to GeosChem. And they have alpha, like an alpha pinene tracer and a limonene tracer, so two separate tracers. So it's a little bit more explicit than what we do in the TS1 mechanism. And then for what I'm doing is this kind of lumping scheme. Uh, so I have alpha pinene by itself, then beta pinene, basically a double bond with two ring structures, um, limonene, which has two double bonds and one ring structure, and myrosine, which are more linear um, compounds that have three or more double bonds. And then I move the aromatics out of the terpenes and put them either with bigene for the double bond or with the xylenes. Mm -hmm. And then the beta carrier filing or all the sesquiterpenes are like in the beta carry their own, so similar to the TS1 mechanism. So even if you're not necessarily familiar with all of these compounds, you can see that the structures are fairly similar and that you probably have like uh, the, the rates and stuff more, more appropriate and the chemistry more appropriate to you. Um, and most of the experimental evidence is all based on alpha pinene, beta pinene, and limonene, so all of these are in the shaded boxes. 
So we don't have a lot of information for all the other terpenes. So all, most of my mechanism is based on these compounds. Uh, so that's just a constraint on we don't have experimental knowledge um, for more than that. Um, this might be something cool that we could do with Gecko in the future, or because of course we can't necessarily do experiments and learn the detailed chemistry on all of them because that's going to be pretty costly. Um, but maybe I think in the future we'll probably have more um, experimental knowledge, and it might motivate splitting up some of these compounds um, specifically. The ring structures, some of these compounds act differently just because of where the ring is, ring is uh, structured. But at the same time, it seems like since we don't have much knowledge, just lumping them with beta pinene is fine for now. So this is a quick schematic of the terpenes. Um, so I have alpha pinene, beta pinene, limonene, myrosine, and beta caryophyllene. And then they'll react with OH to form peroxy radicals, separate peroxy radicals. And then those will react with NO, RO2, and HO2 to form shared first generation products. So it's important to have shared first generation products because that decreases the number of transported species that you have to actually add into the model. And they can have shared um, products based on the chemical structures on, on the compounds. Uh, so, and then they also have shared later generation chemistry too. But all of the branching ratios for these are in different depending on the proxy radicals. And so this adds um, about 26% time to the run and the isoprene added 18%. So it's about a 50% increase. So you can add, increase the, comp the and I, I think that all this isoprene and terpene chemistry updates are pretty substantial increases in the chemistry, um, much more explicitly representing things, and you're only increasing the runtime by 50%. So I think this is pretty modest, especially when you consider going from one degree to half degree resolution. That's a factor of eight increase because you also have to change the time step. Uh, then when you add in this chemistry, it's only 50% increase. So this kind of try, I'm trying to kind of motivate that increasing the chemistry doesn't have to be too, so expensive that it can't be done anymore. Um, and then this scheme is more advanced than any of the previous schemes that have recently um, been published. So, and what's important about it is that the more reactive terpenes are uh, separated from the less reactive terpenes. And so you'll account for um, differences in these different terpene speciation much more cleanly with a mechanism like this than other mechanisms. So I also want to highlight that I'm not doing this yet, but I think it would be good to couple the gas phase chemistry to SOA formation. So I, I thought of this as I was creating these chemical mechanisms. So I have tracers for surrogate compounds for SOA precursors. They're not forming SOA yet, but I think that it's important that I'm starting to set up that we could do this in the future, and I think that this is probably where we'll probably end up going in the future as well. So I wanted to compare it to explicit chemical mechanisms and other chemical mechanisms to understand if my chemistry was um, reasonably accurate within, um, and, and I made reasonable assumptions. So I, made, I did a bunch of box modeling, and these are idealized diurnal cycles, um, so 24 hours on the bottom. Um, and they just have isoprene um, as the VOC because I want to just compare one chemistry regime kind of thing. Uh, so blue is the TS1 Mozart mechanism, and the cyan is TS2 Mozart, and MCM is gray, and the Caltech mechanism, which was developed from that review paper, is in black. Um, and then our chemistry wasn't perfectly matching with the Caltech mechanism, so, and I didn't know why, so I did a number of sensitivity tests as well to constrain this. Um, and, the, and so you can see for, well, this part start in the beginning, but um, isopu and IEPOX were definitely representing first generation um, chemistry better with the TS2 Mozart mechanism as compared to more explicit schemes like MCM and Caltech. And then we're getting the isomer distribution of the isoprene nitrates better as well. Um, and then for ozone, we are consistent with um, MCM. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty similar to TS1 Mozart, so we haven't changed ozone too much. Um, but then we're actually higher than the Caltech mechanism. And this is largely to do with the sensitivity case where the carbonyl nitrate photolysis is um, higher in our model than in the Caltech mechanism. But um, through talking with uh, Kelvin and others, they're going to probably increase these carbonyl nitrate photolysis because it is known that the carbonyl nitrates will photolyze faster. So in future work, uh, Kelvin Bates is updating the Caltech mechanism for GeosCAM. Uh, our mechanisms will probably align much better. But this is just saying um, to say that the isoprene chemistry is reasonably well, um, looks good compared to MCM and both the Caltech mechanism as well. And then I also did out the same thing for alpha pinene. Um, and 
now we have the only explicit chemical mechanism is in gray um, for MCM. And for alpha-pinene, um, we, we would expect TS1 Mozart and TS2 Mozart to match fairly well, because mostly TSN Mozart is assuming most of the terpenes act like alpha-pinene. And in a, in a degree, we do see that, because alpha, the alpha-pinene tracer looks good um, in other later generation products. For ozone, we are un, we're actually have a lot less ozone forming um, than MCM or the TS1 Mozart mechanism. And then I did some sensitivity tests to understand this, and that's because of the assumptions for the pin and aldehyde later generation oxidation chemistry. And that is not really well constrained. So a lot of the later generation chemistry for consistently is not well constrained at all. Um, so MCM is using lower nitrate yields than what we assume. I'm using parameterization based off the Winberg et al. 2018 paper. Um, that was also used for isoprene, so that way my isoprene and terpene schemes are consistent across the nitrate yields for those that are not known. Um, but that's largely the case, for alpha pinene at least. And then for beta pinene and limonene, I have to explain another sensitivity test I'm using for MCM, so I'm going to quickly do that. Uh, MCM has an odd assumption for what happens to the unsaturated nitrates. So MCM assumes that the unsaturated nitrates, so these are nitrates with one double bond, will, they have a fast OHA constant, but instead of reacting at the double bond, as they should, um, and then forming a nitrate, instead they hydrogen abstract and always release the NO2 group. And so this completely changes their NOx recycling. Uh, so it's just like a caveat of if you use MCM and assume that it's the best chemistry, you should really look at the chemistry because this isn't actually quite right. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, and it's a simplification they do probably to reduce their number of compounds but it completely changes your NOx recycling, and then it's going to mess up your ozone. Uh, so at first, I thought my mechanisms were really off, and then I realized it's because of this assumption that they're using. So in all of these cases, OH will add to the double bond, and you'll form another nitrate. You won't just release the NO2. Um, so in my box modeling results, you kind of see the same thing. For So this is beta pinene. Um, the TS2 Mozart is in cyan. Uh, MCM is in gray, so we were under predicting ozone. And it largely has to do with this sensitivity case where we assume the same thing, that the unsaturated nitrates, they'll react with OH and, and release an NO2 group instead of forming an organic nitrate, as they should. And we have good agreement, or fairly good agreement with MCM. So just a kind of weary thing for MCM that you have to pay attention to what chemistry it's actually doing. Um, and that's the same case for limonene. Uh, which also forms a lot of these unsaturated uh, nitrates that we are under predicting ozone compared to MCM, but that's largely because of this sensitivity case where we can describe most of that because of this assumption that MCM is making. So MCM was still really useful when I was comparing to these mechanisms because we can, I'm not going to go over all of the tracers, but you can see how things are matching up. And then oftentimes I would like add in one more compound so that things would match up closer to MCM. But you do have to be wary that it's not a perfect mechanism either. So then, um, moving on to actual results. <laughs> that was just a description of the chemistry. So I plugged these mechanisms into CSM CamChem. -Cam. Um, and so these are changes in MDA surface ozone from the updated case minus the base case. Uh, the top one is just the Henry's Law constant updates. I haven't really mentioned this yet, but Mary Barth uh, determined what the Henry's Law constants were for all the TS1 species. Uh, and I've added this into CSM CamCam. -Cam. So now all of our species are undergoing wet and dry deposition consistently in the model and with updated uh, Henry's Law constants. This has kind of a modest change on ozone. Uh, then I do things iteratively. So we test adding in Henry's Law updates and isoprene updates. Um, and this has a couple PPB reductions in ozone consistently and up to six PPB for the isoprene. But then specifically for the terpenes, which are not tip typically added um, as completely as we have in this mechanism, you have larger reductions up to 7 ppb. Um, and consistently across the eastern US, where we see this largest bias up to 5 ppb, or around 5 ppb, or 4 to 5 ppb differences. So the terpenes really matter a lot. And so we want to know, so we're removing this bias. Um, but we want to know, are we removing the bias for the right reasons, or just are we removing, are we going, pushing, adding more biases into the model? So in order to constrain that, you have to look at field campaign observations. 
So we're looking at the seekers field campaign observations. Um, and namely, you really want to look at ozone, ozone precursors like NOx and VOCs, and also the NOx reservoir species, uh, typically like organic nitrates and the speciated organic nitrates. And so what was really nice is the seekers DC8 payload, and a lot of studies have already taken advantage of this, has really nice um, obser observations for a lot of the ozone precursors. And so those are the red white tracks here. So we compare the model against the seekers field um, campaign results. Uh, so these are median vertical profiles for ozone NO and NO2. Um, and I'm just looking at the southeast US. Um, and I restricted the data in the same way as Travis Saul 2016's paper to remove urban plumes, fire plumes, and stratospheric air, where we might be missing that kind of thing in like a, a global model that's at one degree resolution. So we want to kind of compare fairly, <laughs> or as fairly as possible. Um, and so we're still, we're over predicting ozone um, throughout. And we have this kind of odd shape. It's not perfect. Uh, especially when you add in the terpene chemistry. So sorry, black is observations, TS1 is red, uh, the Henry's updates is gold, blue is Henry's all plus isoprene updates, and cyan is our full TS2 chemistry with all of the updates. And specifically when we add the terpene chemistry, we have larger reductions in ozone. Um, and I just want to also point out that when you update the terpene chemistry, you actually have a uh, decrease in NO2 as well. And I think this is important as well because sometimes people compare this to the um, the satellite observations, and they just automatically tank down emissions when NO2 is off. But it could be also a chemistry problem because you're not getting your losses right. So you're either getting your emissions or your losses wrong. Um, so I thought that was an interesting thing to point out. Uh, I will also look at temperature, winds, and photolysis. Mostly this was just, I'm only nudging the model at 1%, and I wanted to make sure the simulations were pretty consistent for winds, temperature, and clouds, basically. And they are fairly consistent, so that's good. Um, we're actually looking pretty good for the photolysis of NO2, which I was, that was interesting. But it also might be because we're undersampling clouds in field observations, so it's hard to say for that one. For biogenic VOCs, we're underpredicting them largely. And it's interesting, the profile doesn't look quite right. It, maybe we're not getting enough mixing, um, so we don't have enough high enough concentrations in the upper, um, or not like uh, about one kilometer or so. Um, uh, and then the speciated, for the speciated terpenes, we're doing fairly well. Alpha pinene may be a little overpredicted. Beta pinene, considering it's not just beta pinene, looks okay. So I think things look generally okay for the biogenic VOCs, but maybe a little underpredicted. And remember that isoprene is a little underpredicted like this. So we expect the same thing for the isoprene first generation oxidation products. Mm -hmm. Um, and you can see with the oxidation products that isoblue was a, a little bit too high for the T1, TS1 mechanism, and now it's more in line with what we would expect. Um, HPLs are still quite underpredicted. Um, this might be a resolution issue. This comes from the isomerization channel, and it might be more, it might need finer resolution in order to capture that perfectly. Um, if we have kind of a, I know that's uh, too averaged out. You might not get the right each belt. So that might be causing it. And we're going to be looking at finer resolution with this chem chemical scheme. So we'll be able to see if that goes away. And then for the second generation isoprene derived organic nitrates, things are looking really well, but much better. So, and mostly because I just added more species. Uh, so we were mostly lumping all of them as NOAA um, in the T1 mechanism. And now I have several more, um, methacrylene and MBK, and MBK nitrates, and also ethanol nitrate. Um, and these compare really well with the observations. And if you look at the total, NOAA um, is pretty high. And we're getting too many um, the, of these second generation nitrates um, if you lump them all as NOAA, likely because these have larger loss processes than the NOAA does itself. That'll, I'll explain that a little more in uh, later slides, too. And then we look at total organic nitrates um, and total proxy nitrates. We're under predicting the total organic nitrates. Other models are doing this too. This is the GEOS chem results. Um, I think we're under predicting a little less than them, so that's kind of fun. <laughs> um, they're about 200 ppt, and we're at 300 ppt or so. Uh, I think this is largely because of the terpene updates. Um, their isoprene chemistry is fairly similar to the chemistry that I've updated. Um, so because of this, they, they might have more improvement when they update to our terpene chemistry updates as well. Um, and then if we really need to figure out, though, why are models under predicting these organic nitrates? Because if they're really important for losing NOx in the atmosphere, then it might be, um, it might be really important to account for them. Um, and this might add to the remaining ozone bias. 
So this is a slide just showing the total distribution of the organic nitrates compared to the TS1 mechanism on the left. And on the right is a TS2 mechanism. And you can see that we're, we're in the TS2 mechanism, our total isoprene nitrates is lower. And this is largely because of these second generation nitrates. So as I showed you before in the Seekers field campaign, we compared better with those second generation nitrates. So I think this is the, a step in the right direction. Uh, the TS2 terpene, terpenes are actually higher than the TS1 terpenes. Um, and this is largely because I have separated out the primary um, and secondary uh, organic nitrates versus the tertiary organic nitrates. You don't need to know too much of that, but the tertiary organic nitrates will undergo fast aerosol uptake and hydrolysis. The others will not. And so if you lump them all together and include a moderate uh, organic nitrate um, uptake to aerosol, you end up probably underpredicting those terpenes. I mean, underpredicting those terpene nitrates. So I think this is uh, an improvement for the TS2 chemical mechanism. So I told you before that the fate of the organic nitrates is really important for capturing ozone. So these are the fates of the organic nitrates uh, for all of the organic nitrates, isoprene and terpenes. Um, and in all of the cases, this aerosol uptake term becomes really important. And it's like it's least constrained in the model. There's not a lot of observational constraint. There's not a lot of experimental constraint. And it's probably the main tuning knob now that modelers are probably going to start using. So it's definitely something that we need um, to uh, to have further constraints on from the modeling side. And this is consistent with other studies. Ge Geos Chem from the Fisher et al. 2016 paper also showed this. And so I made another one of assumptions within these, uh, when I was developing these chemical mechanisms. And, that, um, and there's still some uncertainties in all of these pathways. So I just wanted to represent the different uncertainties by doing uh, several sensitivity tests. And I'm not going to go into uh, too much detail on all of the sensitivity tests, but I just want to talk about it in general. Um, so um, uh, the first three are for isoprene. So there are uncertainties in isoprene, first generation and second generation, formation of nitrates. Um, and there are a couple PPB differences in ozone. So they're all the updated case minus the TS2 case. And then for the terpenes, you see also the uncertainties that we have in the formation of the nitrates are also a couple of PBB differences in the simulation of ozone. So I think this is important because isoprene is emitted a lot um, more in the southeast US of the terpenes. So we've always thought that the isoprene chemistry is the most important part. But now our uncertainties for isoprene chemistry are a lot less. And so the uncertainties in the terpene chemistry, even though there's not as many terpenes there, are, become, are having just as much impact as the uncertainties in isoprene chemistry on ozone. So it means that we can probably have uh, increased constraint on the model by targeting these terpenes and having more, um, more understanding on the formation pathways of these terpene organic nitrates. Um, and then, so remember this, all of these formation pathways have a couple PPB uh, so or so effects on the model individually. And then I also wanted to emphasize the importance of this aerosol uptake of organic nitrates because there's not a lot of constraints on this. So if you completely remove this term, and a lot of models are not including the organic nitrates undergo aerosol uptake, uh, this is rather new and was first added in the Fisher et al. 2016 Geos Chem paper. You can increase your ozone by up to 5 ppb, um, which is pretty large. And then I wanted to emphasize that we're kind of in the middle of reasonable assumptions that you could assume for this. We could increase ozone by a couple of ppb or decrease ozone by um, up to 3 ppb by still reasonable assumptions based off of observations and experiments. But there's not a lot of constraints. So for the aerosol uptake term, you can have up to like almost an APPB difference depending on how you actually play with it in the model. So I think this is really important because other models are going to use different assumptions. And this could be a major, ploy, major player in why ozone is different between the models. And we definitely need more constraints on it. And so I think there's a twofold problem where we need more constraints from the experimentalists, but we also have to add more description into the models itself. Um, so big picture future work, I think we need to couple SOA formation more clearly with the ozone. Um, so then the SOA problem becomes also a coupled problem with ozone. Um, and you know, it, traditionally in many schemes, and that's what it is in the TS1 mechanism, VBS is on its own, and then there's the gas phase chemistry, and that's how what dictates ozone formation. Um, and we, and in the atmosphere, really, 
that's the way it's going to form with the gas phase chemistry. So it's really much more coupled with the gas phase chemistry. So we should be doing that too. And other models have started doing this for isoprene chemistry. So it's not a far leap to do this. And I've set up these schemes so that we could start doing this as well. And I'm not saying you have to include all the SOA precursors. It's just lumped SOA precursors, similar to what we do in the gas phase. And I think this will be really important for capturing these organic nitrates aerosol uptake um, better within the model. Because right now, the organic nitrate undergoes aerosol uptake. If not, you can, it can come back off, and it just is assumed to undergo hydrolysis. So that makes it much harder to represent accurately. What we need to have is organic nitrate, based on its volatility, will go into the aerosol. Then we'll have a hydrolysis rate that will form nitric acid. So that would be a better representation. And if the fate of the organic nitrates is a lot to determine based on this aerosol um, uptake, then we do need to be describing this better within models. So I just wanted to show you the first plot, the top plot I already showed you. This is the TS1 Mozart mechanism. So with the TS2 Mozart mechanism, we're making kind of modest changes, <laughs> but we definitely are going in the right direction. And I think it's for the right reasons, which is good. Um, so we have definitely cooler colors um, here in the TS2 Mozart mechanism, but we haven't gotten there completely yet. And I think there's a lot of things that still need to be um, fixed within the model. But I think this is a valuable goal to try to get ozone right for the right reasons within CSM ChemChem, -Chem, um, because I think then there's going to be a lot more interest in the community for using this model. So I think that would be a valuable goal that we could try to do in the next couple of years. Um, there's more things to do. We're working, Forrest and I are working on Chem SERR Chem uh, development. So this is a resolution um, thing. So we're developing CSM ChemChem -Chem SER. That's the Spectral element regional refinement version of ChemChem. -Chem. It there's this like plot here. It's got one degree resolution in the globe, but then it can go to regionally fine down to 14 kilometers. And because ozone formation is so nonlinear, we're expecting this has a large consequence on further improving ozone. And part of this project, most, a lot of the project will be using the TS1 mechanism, but some of this project will be putting in the TS2 chemical mechanism as well, um, and determining if when you go to finer resolu horizontal resolution, do you also need finer chemical resolution, um, and seeing the differences in the effects. Uh, so these are just quick movies, hourly movies of the ozone. And we don't yet have the um, anthropogenic emissions on a um, uh, regridded, so they're just on a one degree grade right now. We're still working on that. But uh, you can still see differences even then. Uh, oh, and part of this I forgot to mention. So we were using CMIP6 emissions for all of the work past. We're now moving to NEI 2014. Um, and we're going to add in a diurnal profile for, profile for all of the key anthropogenic pollutants. So this will also have added consequence as well. So there's a lot of uh, new uh, future steps that will probably happen probably within the next year or so um, that will uh, improve this bias further. And I just wanted to show CO and isoprene too, because I think CO is really interesting that you're starting to really see different, um, different formalities and where th this looks way more washed out. And then for isoprene, we've actually regridded these emissions. And you can start to see completely, like, very much, there's much more concentrated zones in the CAMSE regional refinement versus the one degree version, which is the CAMSE at the top. Um, and I just want to motivate too, I'm working on updates to alkane chemistry as well. So if I'm not going to talk too much about this, but if you want to, any of these updates for isoprene, terpenes, or alkane chemistry, I'm once this hasn't been quite finished, but I think the mechanism is largely finished, um, just a little bit more evaluation. And then lots more needs to be done in the evaluation comparison to field campaign results. Um, but I'm going to combine my isoprene updates, terpene updates, and alkane updates together. And so if there's interest in anyone using any of these, then let me know. And if there's interest in like me helping with any of the other VOC oxidations and updating this, um, I can help with that too. Um, I'm going to be updating the VOCs for fires for FireX campaign, probably, probably not before the campaign starts, <laughs> but uh, in the future. Um, so that's another thing that is moving in that direction. Um, and so in conclusion, updating and adding more complex isoprene and terpene chemistry has a large impact on simulated surface ozone. Uh, the terpene oxidation, which has, had, has been really heavily ignored in the past um, and or heavily reduced in most schemes, is actually really important. So we need to be um, adding, more, uh, adding it more completely into models. 
And we really need further constraints on the aerosol uptake and to be actually representing this better within the model so that we have uh, less uncertainties as well in ozone. And future work will include emissions and horizontal resolution improvements. Um, but hopefully, I'm going to work with some other people also on the dynamics and ozone deposition. So hopefully, we can try to get ozone right for the right reasons with a concerted effort within our newest models. And with that, I'll take any questions. Thanks, Vicky. It was great. So, so I've been thinking about the ozone altitude profile that you showed. Oh, uh, yes. And actually, if you uh, have any suggestions on how to fix no, it. No, I've been thinking about it because be I, I, I forgot what was all off, right? I mean, the, the, the ozone profile is better, but it's still pretty bad. Now, now some yeah. of the nitrate profiles are also quite off. I, I'm just wondering mm -hmm. whether that could be used to get some insight into what, what the uptake problem might be. You know, if you, if you look at that, your model tells you that, that the aerosol uptake of the nitrates is the largest uncertainty. Mm -hmm. uh, now, mm -hmm. if the ozone's off like this, the aerosols should be more aged as they go up from the canopy, right? Mm -hmm. So if your nitrates are off somewhere, I mean, I forgot what, what they were, but they were all, you know, some of them were all over the place. You this know, maybe it makes sense if you look at all that together and... and and say, well, if the uptake was this way, that way, what would I expect from the, the nitrate profiles versus the ozone profiles? Yeah, yeah, no, that's, that's a suggestion. That's a good suggestion. I want to do maybe a little bit more work to just make sure that this isn't just a dynamics issue within the model. So I'm, I'm just not, I, I'm leaning towards it might be a dynamics issue. Uh, so once we figure that out. It's a very common problem. You have the same problem in Parquet. Oh, okay. With the ozone. Okay, yeah. And it may be as easy as ozone deposition. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We're, we're curious to see, I mean, we don't have these results yet, but we'll pretty shortly be running the 14 kilometer resolution with the TS1 mechanism and, and the updated isoprenotropic chemical mechanism. And we're curious to see if some of that improves this, because we're already seeing that at 14 kilometer resolution, it affects the vertical profiles as well. So we'll see if this is going to, hopefully it goes away. <laughs> Maybe it won't go. Okay, well, maybe, no, maybe it won't. Just yeah. Um, there's also a certain degree, I didn't show this, but how much you nudge in the model really affects those profile shapes. So it also could be, oh, sorry, a nudging issue. Um, these are just quick plots. Red is the 32 levels with 50 hour relaxation time for nudging. Um, the gold is the 32 level, five hour relaxation. Um, blue, 56, 50 hour, and Cyan is a 56, 50 hour or five hour relaxation. You can see whenever you're doing a five hour relaxation, you change the profile a lot. So it's potential we're also kind of adding some effects with this profile by nudging. So we might need to look into this in the future as well. But they're still all fundamentally different. You know, all of those profiles look fundamentally different than the aircraft. That is true. That is true, yeah. Mm -hmm. Any more? Thanks, it was a good talk. Um, I have a question. You mostly focus on the eastern US and it really improved uh, the ozone there. But did you also look globally? Um, because, you, you know, you mostly showed that. And the other question I have is that if you have higher resolution, usually it's uh, known that the ozone is changing because of the resolution, but you haven't really commented on that. Yeah, and so for this study, I really wanted to focus on development of the isoprene and terpene chemical mechanisms. So that's why I just focused on the Southeast US and I really wanted to look at the field campaign results. But next step is to do that. Um, and I've already started that a little bit where I look at different resolutions and then I'm looking more at a global picture and the impact of that. It does seem, I don't have those plots. Um, this is kind of preliminary because I, I haven't made final <laughs> things with it, but it does actually seem important even over, um, it seems like the chemistry and the resolution is important over Asia area. There's large differences there as well. Um, probably the terpenes are pretty prevalent there, that's why. Um, so there definitely will be differences in the global picture too. For this study though, I'm mostly focusing on the Southeast US. Yeah. 
Uh, yeah, for these third generation organic nitrates that go into the aerosol phase. Do you have a feeling, um, uh, do they come mostly from NO3 reactions or do they come from just standard uh, NO reactions with the RO2 from the first two generations? That's a really good question. So on this schematic, I'm just showing you actually the OH chemistry. But the NO3 chemistry, especially for terpenes, does become really important. I haven't yet done a, a thorough comparison on exactly like whether it's OH chemistry or NO chemistry that's most important. Um, it's not just the later generation chemistry products, like for example, isoprene. It's not third generation isoprene products. Uh, the, even just these first generation hydroxy nitrates, some of them, especially this tertiary one, will undergo aerosol uptake because it has really fast hydrolysis. So it's not just later generation organic nitrates, it's all of them. Um, I, want to, I want to do a more thorough comparison. My, my fear is that the NO3 chemistry may not be perfectly represented in our model because you have to get the boundary layer and everything perfect, perfectly represented. So I haven't done a lot of looking at that. I did update the NO3 chemistry so that we can do this in the future, but I haven't done a lot of comparison with this model yet. But that's something definitely that we can do in the future. Anyone else? No? If not, let's thank again Becky.